I'm going to have a look at Wagner now and his writing for the instrument and the master singer, so we're sure that he's composed. Looking at the end section of it, the tube excerpt that's quite famous here. Um, what I'm looking at is just the lyrical string like um, gaps that, or lack of gaps, that is written here. So it's almost like the tuba forms a bass, a really solid harmonic rock for this piece of music, for the orchestra to sit on. So it starts off, but it's all long notes, it's all fairly um, slow. <laughs> So as you can hear, it's all long, there's no gaps in it, it's always like a big arco um, double bass part that you don't have to breathe, or string, well, string players do have to breathe, but don't have to breathe to play. Um, writing for the tuba is almost, or writing for brass, it's a bit like writing for the organ. You've got to allow room for sometimes the pipes to breathe in between um, notes and in between phrases. Similarly, that's how you've got to write for this kind of stuff. And it's very hard to find places in this to breathe. It's all so strong out, it's all so grand that you've got to just snatch a breath here and there. Um, the writing, it's a it's very harmonic. Um, the whole brass section moves as a big section in this piece, especially the lower ones, and it's just going to be a nice big sound, a nice strong rock to sit on. And it climaxes up towards that top E, the opening phrase, quite high on the tuba, it rings out really well once you get there, and that really adds a sense. Well, that's where the pe that phrase was going. Um, we then come in straight after that with this. interesting is the way that Wagner has written those dynamics. So he's written 40, then he's written Semper 40, and then he's written Pui 40, and then he's written Pui 40 again, and then it's Fortissimo. So he's wanted it just to come down a little, down a little more, down a little bit more again, or down at the same level again, and then this big Fortissimo climax in that bar. And he's harmonically moving up an octave when he's doing this. It's what he's aiming to do um, each time that he um, brings these to the end. There's someone at the door. <laughs> We're now down in the living room because the um, sunlight's going in the window up the stairs a bit too much. It looked like someone was at the door there, but there's not. It's just the light coming in. So returning now. Um, so we're moving up to that climax, and then we come back with this big string part. And that's the end of the sort of really famous tuba part. Um, 
for the master singers. Well, that end sort of writing is a little bit like the horn, and perhaps the reason for that is that the horn, when the or brass was first introduced in the orchestra, the horns sat on one side and they provided the sort of depth of the brass sound. They were the harmonic end of the brass section. And they still sit on the side of the orchestra today that they originally sat on um, when the orchestra was formed. Trumpets moved a little bit, they sat on the opposite side and they had more of the tune and a lot of the higher parts, which they still do today. And the addition has been the trombone section and tubas, tenor tubas, those kind of instruments, contrabass tubas, that have all been added in to the orchestra to give it the depth of sound. So the horn and the tuba are the two kind of closest related instruments within the orchestra brass wise. The trombones and the trumpets, their bells face forward, so their sound characteristics are a force. The music that they're playing is almost coming directly at the bell and out towards the audience. The music the horn and the tubas play, the horn's bell sits behind the chairs like this when you're playing it. Imagine it as a horn. And it's kind of going to the side and backwards, and the tubas and euphoriums when they're in the orchestra, their sounds going up the way. So you're not getting a full direct impact um, from that. Sousa um, changed the bell so that you could get the music coming through from from the bell. He pushed it forwards. Um, bass bell or the helicon, which is an early brass bass instrument, so that the sound come, came forward more like the trumpet, more like the trombone and again the chimbasso is another instrument that tries to um, that's a, it's basically a contrabass trombone, covers the same register as a tuba but the bell faces forward like a trombone so it's got a more penetrating sound the horns and the, bra the, horns and the tubas um, really provide a supporting sound to everything else that's going on and that's key in the writing that Wagner was written here it's all nice and long, all nice and sustained um, and it's just a big presence that everything else is grounded on. So let's play the whole thing through. When we work up towards those climaxes, we're going to um, look at all the dynamics all the way through. When it breathe, breathing's a little bit tricky in the middle phrases because you've got these long phrases. And I like to breathe um, after the tied middle. <laughs> Sometimes maybe not trying as much to be in between the bars. I feel like that's where that natural gap is to breathe there because it then pushes the music on. If I was to breathe after that, you get a gap and it stops a little bit. Whereas the motion of the music's moving on to the next note. earlier ones, perhaps breaking that tie, so that goes against what's written, but it gives it a better sense, I feel. So let's go back, let's put the whole thing through, and bear in mind the thoughts that we just had of um, it being like a string bass, being like being an extension of the horn section, all those kind of dynamics that are tin characteristics that then characterise the tuba. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, the last phrase, i um, never covered it there, that's the sort of most famous part. There's lots of suspense there to build up, lots of key um, phrasing towards the end of bars is what's used there. Whenever we want to create suspense in music, we often repeat bars, and that's what Wagner does really well. And it really, what it does is to relieve all the tension that's brought up, it repeats one of the opening tunes with the brass um, working as a unison section. So that's what we've got to get the idea of here, is that we're sitting with the trumpets, with the trombones, with the horns in the back of the orchestra, and we're forming all one big unison section. And that's how the writing is. We've got these short quavers at the end, dum, da da dum, da da dum. So that really tight, nice sound, will really firm up the end of the piece. Master Singer's Overture.